Hello and welcome to the Command Phase. My name is Mark and thank you so much for joining me. With the latest version of 10th edition 40k, keywords were introduced in order to simplify what special rules and stratagems can target them. For example, the grenade core stratagem can only be utilised by a unit with the grenade's keyword, which is highlighted in the stratagem under the target. These keywords are found at the bottom of each of the datasheets for every unit. There are also faction keywords found at the bottom of the datasheet, but these are just to help you determine which units can and can't go together in one army. For example, you can bring any number of Adeptus Astartes keyword units in an army, but you aren't able to bring Marnius Kalgar, who has the Ultramarine faction keyword, with Vulcan Hestan, who has the Salamanders faction keyword. But a bigger change was the reintroduction of Universal Special Rules. These core abilities like Deep Strike now cover all the different army's abilities. This is a nice change from previous editions where this ability was named differently for pretty much every army. Even though the vast majority of the player base ended up calling it Deep Strike anyway for easier understanding. This is the same for weapon abilities to help make them more distinctive, with the introduction of sustained hits, precision and indirect fire just to name a few. While these may take a little time to get used to, and referring back to the rulebook to remember what each of them means, it's far better to have to learn one standardised set rather than one for each army. In this video I'll be going over each of the Universal Special Rules, Core and Weapon abilities so you'll have an understanding of what each of these mean going into your next games. Hopefully this will be a valuable resource for you and if you wanted to skip to a specific ability there are timestamps in the description below. So without any further ado, let's get stuck in. Starting off with the universal abilities, we have Deadly Demise. This ability triggers when a unit that has this ability dies. You then roll a d6. If you roll a 6, this unit will deal X mortal wounds to all units within a 6 inch range of the explosion. For example, the Tyranid's Turvagon has the Deadly Demise d6 ability, so if you do roll a 6 to trigger it, you would then roll another d6 for the damage number, which if you do roll another 6, could be devastating to either yourself or your opponent. Do note that certain detachments in the game have stratagems that trigger off Deadly Demise. The Corrosive Viscera stratagem for the Crusher Stampede is one example of this, making the explosions happen automatically. Whereas the Orcs have the Kareen stratagem to move the vehicle if it does explode, which can be great to get it away from your lines to protect your units or even right into the middle of your opponents to deal significant damage, which is a pretty cool game moment. The Deep Strike ability allows you to set up your unit in strategic reserves rather than on the board at the start of the game. Then at the end of your movement phase you can drop them onto the board no closer than 9 inches away from any of your opponent's units. You can of course shoot and charge as normal once you have done so. Unless it's mentioned in the mission rules, turn 1 deep strikes are once again possible. This is a great way to be able to get to certain areas of the board to engage problematic units you couldn't get to if you started on the board on turn 1, get to distant objectives and complete secondaries in their deployment zone, as long as your opponent hasn't screened out their backfield to stop you landing back there. Some units in the game, like Alaris Custodians, have abilities to move back into reserves from the tabletop to be able to deep strike again, allowing you to redeploy them back to a different area of the board where you'll need them. Definitely something to watch out for. Feel No Pain is a really strong defensive ability, allowing units that have failed their save of any kind and taken wounds to potentially mitigate some of that damage. For each point of damage taken, you roll 1d6. If the roll is over the value of X, then that wound is ignored. This can really add to the durability of a unit, especially if they're multi-wound models, as this gives a higher chance of more models in that unit surviving. For example, the Adeptus Sororitas Arcoflagellants have the Feel No Pain 4 Plus ability on their two wound profile, so they would have a 50% chance to negate a lost wound which in a large squad size would mean your opponent would need to put a lot more shots into them to make sure they go down. Do note that you would get a feel no pain roll against any mortal wounds as this triggers before damage is applied. The fight phase has been split into two different steps, fights first and remaining combats. 
This makes Fight First an incredibly strong defensive ability, especially with the change in the ordering to this step where the defender, not the charging attacker, gets to go first. While charging would make your unit go into the fight first step compared to those without this ability, if you charged into a unit with fights first, they would get the first swing. So definitely one to be careful of. Firing Deck is a nice ability to have come into this edition. It allows a number of units embarked inside a transport to fire their weapons depending on the value of the Firing Deck X ability. For example, the Drakari Raider has Firing Deck 11 on its datasheet, which means that up to 11 Drakari infantry models would be able to add their weapons to that vehicle's attacks, whereas an Orc Battle Wagon has a massive Firing Deck 22. Just to note, it's the vehicle that makes the attacks, not the passengers, so any buffs or debuffs that apply to the vehicle shooting will do so to these shots too. If every model in a unit has the Infiltrator's ability, they can be deployed anywhere on the board more than 9 inches away from an enemy unit. This is a fairly straightforward ability and can be very strong in getting an early advantage to board control on objectives, or if you're lucky enough to get the first turn, get stuck in really quickly. Many characters in 10th edition have the leader ability. This allows them to join other squads during deployment, often providing buffs to that unit. The unit they join then become the character's bodyguard, protecting the character from almost all attacks until all of that unit has been destroyed. We will cover precision later on in the video, which you'll be able to find easily enough with the video chapters below. For example, an Apothecary Biologist can join an Aggressor Squad, Eradicator Squad or Heavy Intercessor Squad and when doing so, they will receive the Surgical Precision ability providing the unit with lethal hits. Do note, leaders are restricted to only joining certain units which can be found on the back of their data cards and typically only one leader can join any squad. There are of course some exceptions in the game such as this apothecary can join the same squad as a captain or chapter master as shown on the datasheet. Another straightforward yet powerful ability is Lone Operative, where the model can't be targeted by enemies more than 12 inches away. This is a great ability to have for someone holding a backfield objective as the opponent will have to come up close to stop this point scoring, plus it's great protection in moving up the board yourself. The Scout ability allows the unit to make a normal move up to X inches after deployment before the first turn begins. This includes the dedicated transport that this unit is embarked inside as long as only models with this ability are in the transport. This move must end outside of 9 inches from all enemy models. This can be really useful to push forward to grabbing or contesting midfield objectives on turn 1, closer to perform actions for secondaries and generally controlling the midfield, plus potentially getting some better firing angles on your opponent's models. Last of the core abilities we have Stealth which is a great defensive ability for a unit. If every model in your unit has the Stealth ability then ranged attacks targeting that unit are minus 1 to their hit rolls. This is a great deterrent for your opponent shooting at these and keeping your unit alive longer. This update is a massive change to the weapon type system that have been in effect since 3rd edition of 40k which granted each weapon just one type. Rather than being defined by this single type, such as heavy or assault, and a text box of special rules, weapons now pull from a selection of standardised weapon abilities. These weapon abilities aren't mutually exclusive. Bolt rifles now have both the heavy and assault abilities, which in this example effectively grants them two different firing modes, whereas some, like this shuriken cannon, have two abilities together that affect its weapon's output. There are many different abilities to go through, so let's see what they all are. First up we have the Anti-Weapon ability. This allows models to score critical wounds, that is an automatic wound irrespective of the target's toughness, against particular targets on unmodified wound rolls of X or higher. Any keyword could follow Anti for this ability, but most commonly you'll see these as either Anti-Infantry, Anti-Vehicle or Anti-Monster on the weapon's profile followed by the value you need to roll equal to or higher than to score a critical wound. 
For example, the Orc Beast boss's Beast Chopper has both the anti-monster and anti-vehicle abilities, so if he fights a vehicle in combat, each wound of a 4 plus will automatically wound the vehicle, even if it was a knight with toughness 12, which would normally make his strength 6 weapon only wound on 6s without this ability. Some other abilities like Devastating Wounds, which we'll cover shortly, pair really well with this as they trigger off critical wounds and the anti-abilities make this easier to get them. Next up we have Assault, which is a pretty straightforward ability. This basically allows the unit to shoot its weapons with the Assault ability even on the turn in which they advanced. This is a great way to add mobility to the unit to get to different parts of the table in which you need to get to, plus it also increases the weapon's threat range. For example, the Custodian Guard are typically equipped with either Guardian Spears or Sentinel Blades. Both of these have fairly short range options, but having the ability to move D6 inches and still fire at full profile is really helpful for them to get up to the board closer to the enemy, rather than having to decide whether they need to shoot or advance. The added benefit of assault weapons in the unit is that you're also able to complete an action after advancing instead of shooting these weapons should you wish to. This helps you get that extra movement needed to complete a variety of secondaries in different areas of the board. The blast weapon ability is meant to resemble high explosive rounds, so in this case you add one to the attack characteristic of that weapon for every five models in the target unit that you're shooting at. This is a great way of dealing with massed infantry. For example, if you are firing the Space Marine Desolation Squad's Castellan Launcher at a squad of 20 Necron Warriors, this Blast D3 shot weapon would receive an extra 4 shots per man into that unit from this ability. As a squad of 5, that's a massive 20 extra shots being added to their weapons which can make a big difference. Do note you can't ever make attacks against a unit that is within engagement range, so while tanks can shoot inside engagement range, they can't target a unit they are in combat with utilising the blast weapon, they'd have to fire it elsewhere. This makes them slightly less effective at clearing up the models they are tied up with, but it's not the end of the world as you can still shoot the gun if you have a target. Weapons with the conversion ability are more powerful, targeting units at longer range. When firing at a target that's at least 12 inches away, they inflict critical hits on an unmodified hit roll of a 4+. While the critical hits don't do anything by themselves, they can trigger abilities like sustained hits and lethal hits. For example, the Votan Brokir Thunderkin equipped with the SP Conversion Beamer has a profile of one attack at a 24 inch range with the abilities Conversion and Sustained Hits D3. So if they were shooting a unit between 13 and 24 inches away, on a 4 plus they would get an additional D3 hits on top, which with its higher damage profile could prove costly for the opponent. Due to the power of this weapon ability, it was updated in the most recent balanced data slate to still be a significantly powerful attack, but no longer inflicting the damage as mortal wounds which can spill over in multi-model units, which was far too powerful. It now works as when a weapon with devastating wounds scores a critical wound, which is normally on at a wound roll of 6, the target cannot take any saves or invulnerable saves against that wound. For example, if an attack made by a Tau Hammerhead Railgun which has devastating wounds with a damage characteristic of D6 plus 6 scores a critical wound roll, instead of allocating the attack and making saving throws normally, the target would automatically suffer D6 plus 6 wounds. You can see this is a great ability to shred through high value targets, although do note if the opponent's unit has the feel no pain ability, they still can be taken from this attack. Typically when you head into combat you select just one of the melee weapons profiles each model is armed with. If the model is equipped with any that also have this extra attacks weapon ability you get to attack with those as well. Do note there is no way to modify the number of attacks you make with these weapons. For example, if you are using the Chaos Demon's Keeper of Secrets in combat, you would select the Wit Stealer Sword for your attacking weapon. You'd also then be able to attack with the Ritual Knife and Snapping Claws on top with their specific number of attacks. The Hazardous Weapon ability is one for the risk rewarders out there. When you need to get that little bit of extra damage through, you can choose to fire this weapon profile instead. With the risk of killing the firing model or inflicting mortal wounds to a character, monster or vehicle firing it. 
After you have fired your weapon, you roll 1d6 for each hazardous weapon being fired. For each roll of a 1, you will deal 3 mortal wounds to a character, monster or vehicle, or otherwise you would remove one model. For example, the Adeptus Mechanicus Catafron destroyers have their Plasma Culverin weapon with the two profiles. You get plus one strength, AP and damage by choosing the supercharged hazardous mode, but each roll of the one in the resulting test at the end of shooting will kill one destroyer. In the right circumstances, it may well be worth the risk. Do note that if a character firing a hazardous weapon is attached to a unit, and you roll a 1, you must still apply those mortals to that leader. You can't offload the plasma overspill onto your troops. The heavy weapon ability is next, and this one is pretty straightforward to remember. Each time a unit firing a weapon with this ability remains stationary, add one to the hit roll. Else, if you did move, you can just fire it at your normal ballistic skill, which is a positive from the last edition. For example, the Adeptus Sororitas Battle Sister Squad can take a multi-melter. This hits at one ballistic skill worse than the typical melter gun due to the size of the weapon. Yet, if you remain stationary, you'd be back hitting on the same 3-up ballistic skill. For tanks like this Exorcist, the Missile Launcher also has the heavy ability, typically hitting on a 3+, but if you remain stationary, you'll be hitting on a 2+, if you can see the target, which really adds the reliability of the weapon if you did remain still. Plus, it also helps to negate the indirect fire hit roll modifier, which we'll cover shortly. It's a nice bonus to have if you can find a way to remain stationary, although you can then weigh up whether you need the movement more to potentially open up line of sight on the target. Cover is pretty commonplace in 10th edition of 40k, so having a weapon ability that's able to ignore all of these benefits to their armor save really helps you to get your damage through. For example, the Eldari Dark Reaper's Shuriken Cannon has the Ignore's Cover ability, meaning their minus one to enemy's armor would have to be taken into account when resolving the attacks, instead of being negated by the plus one armor save that cover would typically provide. Put simply, weapons with the indirect fire ability don't need to have line of sight to the target they are firing at, but you do suffer a minus one to hit penalty, and the enemy unit will gain the benefit of cover to this attack. Typically, this is plus one to their armor save, although this does not apply to models with a save of three up or better against attacks with AP of zero. And multiple instances of cover are not cumulative. For example, an Astra Militarum Basilisk Earthshaker cannon has the indirect weapon ability. It can pretty much hit anywhere on the map and will be doing so on a five to hit rather than a four for a target it cannot see. Although, as mentioned earlier, as it also has the heavy weapon ability, it will get plus one to hit if it remains stationary. Its minus two AP will be negated slightly by cover, making it effectively minus one AP when shooting indirectly. These weapons can be a really good way to throw extra damage onto units your opponent is trying to keep safe, or utilizing in scoring objectives in their backfield where you normally wouldn't be able to shoot them. Purely a close combat ability, Lance gives the user plus one to wound when it's made a charge move. This is a great way of inflicting some more damage in the combat step and allows units to punch up against tougher enemies. For example, the Astra Militarans and Tillan Rough Riders have a variety of options here, but the Hunting Lance with the Melter Tip which would be wounding a Toughness 12 vehicle on a 5 would now be on a 4 plus instead as long as it charged, which can make a big difference. You'll just want to be making sure that you set these up to be able to charge to gain that benefit rather than being charged yourself. Lethal Hits is up next, and weapons with this ability will automatically wound the target on a critical hit roll, i.e. an unmodified hit roll of a 6. This is a fantastic way to get some damage in on a target you wouldn't normally be able to wound that easily, or just making sure you get some guaranteed damage before you roll the remaining wound rolls. For example, Death Guard Poxwalkers in combat using their improvised weapons have the lethal hits ability. Hitting on a 5 plus with strength 3 and AP 0, they aren't going to be doing a huge amount of damage on their own, especially if they had to wound roll as well. But with lethal hits here, 50% of their hitting rolls will guarantee some wounds getting through to the opponent's armor saves. This could really add up depending on the squad size. 
Do note that these lethal hits do not count as critical wounds if you have the Devastating Wounds ability. These will count as normal wounds. Also, if a weapon has both lethal hits and sustained hits and it scores a critical hit, it will cause one automatic wound and generate one or more additional hits that must be rolled to wound as normal. As far as I'm aware, we've only seen the weapon ability Linked Fire on the Eldari Fire Prism datasheet for its Prism Cannon's focused lances attack. This could just be a faction specific ability, but it may well appear in the future elsewhere. This allows one Fire Prism to draw line of sight and measure range to a target from another Fire Prism that the firing one can see, in essence relaying the message of where to strike. Up next we have the high damage shots from the weapons with the Melter X ability. These weapons do an additional X damage to the target within half of their weapon's range. For example, the Drukhari Reavers have the option of a Heat Lance, which has the Melter 3 ability. So if this weapon manages to wound a target that is within 9 inches of it, then it will do D6 plus 3 damage rather than the typical D6 if outside the 9 inch range. These weapons can provide a significant boost to killing power on higher toughness units like monsters and vehicles, although potentially danger close if you didn't manage to remove the target. You may well find it difficult to get your melter units into that kind of range in the first place, so if you do, make sure the shots count. Next up we have the pistol weapon abilities, and you guessed it, these will be found on the close range firearms. This works in exactly the same way as it did in 9th. You can fire these weapons while in engagement range of enemy units, but only at units you're in engagement range with. If you choose to fire your pistol outside of combat, you can't fire any other range weapons that turn. For example, if this Black Templar Primaris Crusader squad decided to shoot their bolt pistols outside of combat, they couldn't utilize any of the other weapons they are equipped with, but inside of combat they are able to shoot the closest target they are engaged with if they are stuck in a prolonged combat and can try to get a little bit of extra chip damage through. This can be pretty handy in this niche case when you aren't able to fire any of your other weapons. If your weapon has the precision ability, when you attack a unit with an attached character, after you wound the squad, if you can see the character itself, you'll be able to direct those attacks at that character rather than the unit that it's leading. The character would then be making the armor save and taking the damage of the attacks if failed. For example, if the Imperial Agent's Vindicare Assassin shoots his Exodus rifle at a squad with an attached character, he would roll to wound against the squad's overall toughness. If the attack does wound, he can choose for this attack to target a character who is in line of sight of him. That character would then have to make a save against an AP-3 attack and, if failed, suffer D3-3 damage. This is a great ability to reduce the output of a squad from the buffs the character is providing them. The Psychic phase was removed in 10th edition and instead Psychers now have additional abilities on their datasheets alongside melee and ranged attacks with the Psychic Weapon ability. If a Psychic Weapon or ability causes any unit to suffer one or more wounds, each of those wounds is considered to have been inflicted by a Psychic attack. While this doesn't have any specific abilities, some others do respond to them, such as the Sisters of Silence Prosecutors, whose Daughters of the Abyss ability gives them a 3-up Feel No Pain against Psychic Attacks. Next up we have the Rapid Fire ability. This is a pretty straightforward one to understand and it gives the weapon X extra shots when it's under half range. For example, a Chaos Space Marine Terminator Squad Combi Bolter has the Rapid Fire 2 ability, so when the target is within 12 inches, each weapon would get 2 extra shots. A weapon with the Sustained Hits X ability inflicts an additional number of hits on a critical hit roll of the value of X. A critical hit is an unmodified hit roll of a 6. For example, the Necron Immortals Tesla Carbine has the Sustained Hits 2 ability, so if any of the attack's hit rolls are a critical hit, they would get an extra 2 hits on top. This can really add up, especially if you have access to full rerolls to potentially fish for those 6s, plus if you have a weapon with both Lethal Hits and Sustained Hits 1 and it scores a critical hit, it would cause an automatic wound and generate one additional hit that must roll to wound as normal. These make for great combos to look out for if you can apply these abilities to your squads, utilizing characters to increase their output. 
Next up, we have Torrent, which is the keyword used for pretty much all flamethrower style weapons in the game. These will automatically hit the target they shoot. For example, we have the Thousand Suns Rubric Marines here with a Warp Flamer. This 12 inch range gun has D6 attacks and whatever you roll will then automatically go straight to the wound rolls. You can see the NA under the ballistic skill here on the datasheet to note that no roll is needed to hit. These weapons are typically fairly deadly when firing overwatch as they won't need sixes to hit, plus they're really useful for firing into enemies that have negative modifiers to hit as they will completely ignore them. Last of all, we have the Twin Linked ability. This allows the bearer to re-roll the wound rolls for the attack, a great ability to add consistency to the weapon. For example, the Space Marines Aggressor Squad have Twin Linked weapons for both shooting and combat, allowing them to make those three attacks for each Auto Bolt Storm Gauntlet and Power Fist wound more reliably. This is a great ability when you're trying to take down a unit that is difficult to wound, plus if you're able to stack this with devastating wounds, you can utilise the rerolls to try and fish for those critical wounds. I do hope you found this video useful, and just a quick note, while these rules are found scattered all over the core rulebook, the Quick Start Guide has them handily grouped together for ease of finding them. This can be found in the download section of the Warhammer Community website, which I'll pop a link in the description below for. Let me know in the comments section below if you have any further questions on any of these abilities. I answer every comment, so I'll do my best to help you out. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that like and subscribe button as it really helps a small channel like me grow and reach more people. Thank you all so much for watching the command phase and I'll see you in the next video.